Members of the university, members of the Tata group, members of the Worth family, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me enormous pleasure on behalf of the University of New South Wales to welcome each of you here to this Wallace Worth Dialogue and to this special honorary degree conferral ceremony. In welcoming you, we acknowledge the Bedigal people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and their elders past and present. In this part of this evening, we assemble to pay tribute to Ratan Tata by awarding him a Doctorate of Business Honoris Causa, one of our highest honours. I want to tell you it's an enormous honour for the entire university that we can welcome Ratan Tata here this evening. He is, as you all know, an important world leader in global development, and we are amazed and absolutely joyous that he is with us tonight. And I might also say, this is evidenced and borne out by the number of you who've come here this evening, and as I say, we welcome you. I now call upon the President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Fred Hilmer, to present the citation. If I could now ask Ratan Tata to stand for the citation. Ladies and gentlemen, today it's our great pleasure to honour Mr. Ratan Naval Tata for his eminent service to the global community. The respected chairman of the Tata Group, which is India's largest and most diversified corporation, Ratan Tata is acknowledged widely for a number of achievements a brilliant businessman, both in India and internationally, a driving force behind the resurgence of India as a world power, a philanthropist with a social conscience, and a passionate advocate for advances in technology, innovation, and higher education. Mr. Tata was born in 1937, and he began his working life in India in 1962 following his graduation from Cornell University in the United States with a degree in architecture. After a short period working in an American architectural firm, he was sent by his family to work in the Tata Group. And his first job was at Tata Steel, where he was assigned to the shop floor, shoveling limestone and operating the blast furnace. For the next nine years, he worked his way through a variety of positions and in 1971 began his managerial career when he was appointed director of the National Radio and Electronics Company, NELCO. After, again, a variety of executive and leadership positions in the group, in 1991, Mr. Tata became chair of Tata Industries. In that role, he embarked on a campaign of modernising the company pulling together the many and loosely connected companies into a group that had several business lines and a centralised management. A hallmark of Ratan Tata's career has been bold ideas and innovation. For example, in 1998, he developed and launched India's first locally manufactured people's car, the Indica. This was followed in 2009 by the development and launch of the Nano, the world's cheapest road car, the $2,000 car, bringing the possibility of new car ownership to many Indians. During his tenure, the Tata Group's revenues have grown more than tenfold, and the acquisition of Tetley, Jaguar Land Rover, and Chorus transformed Tata Industries, which became truly global and no longer dependent on a single economy. This example also signalled the beginning of a wave of acquisitions of foreign businesses by Indian business leaders. The Tata family, in addition to their business leadership, have a long tradition of philanthropy, social responsibility, and a commitment to improving the lives of others. And Ratan Tata has been no exception to that tradition. Tata philosophy, philanthropy is embodied in two trusts established in 1919 and 1974, and those trusts own nearly two-thirds of the parent firm's equity 
and are now chaired by Ratan Tata. But Mr Tata doesn't appear on the Indian and global rich lists because the other Tata tradition he maintains is that of transferring much of his wealth to the many Tata initiatives that work for the greater good. In the 1990s, the trusts moved beyond what is viewed as simple resource transfers, giving money away, into committed sectoral engagement, continuing their extraordinary generosity. A notable but not widely known example of the Tata approach followed the Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2008. At that time, the Tata flagship hotel, the Mumbai Taj Mahal, was a central target of the terrorist attacks and a number of employees were killed and many were injured. In what was a record, two weeks, a new trust was established for employees in order to distribute relief as quickly as possible to the staff as well as others injured in areas surrounding the hotel. Ratan Tata personally visited all of the families of employees who had been killed or injured at the hotel and attended many funerals over a gruelling three-day period. As the chairman of the Tata Group, India's largest non-government employer with 200,000 employees across India, Mr Tata's leadership is a model of ethical work practices, social responsibility and community engagement at the highest level. Many Tata companies are involved in a wide range of community development projects and programs in India and other parts of the world, encompassing many initiatives from welfare of women and children to improving health, education and livelihood. The Tata groups and the trusts encourage and fund leading scholarship in the areas of social responsibility engagement. Today, on the eve of handing over control of Tata Group to his successor, Mr Tata has been focusing his energy and his business acumen on the problem of gender diversity, including increasing the number of women in leadership in Tata companies and more widely, and his efforts are beginning to produce results. Mr Tata also serves on the board of the Ford Foundation and the program board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's India AIDS initiative. He serves in a senior capacity within a number of organisations in India and internationally and is a member of the Prime Minister's Council on Trade and Industry. In 2004, he was named Businessman of the Year for Asia by Forbes magazine. Council, noting his eminent service to the global community, resolved that it would be fitting if the degree of Doctor of Business, Honoris Causa, were to be conferred on Dr Tata. And today we admit him to the university's highest honour. Mr Tata, I now ask you to move forward to the Chancellor for the presentation of your degree. It is an enormous honour. We have a protocol. <laughs> it is an honour and a personal privilege to, in the name of the Council of the University of New South Wales, and as Chancellor of that great university to bestow upon you one of our highest honours, that of Doctor of Business Honoris Causa. We wish you well in what you're going to do and we congratulate you on what you've done. Congratulations, Dr Tata. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes what is for me the shortest graduation I've ever prevailed upon, <laughs> which is, I might say, a sign of Dr. Tata's leadership, and, but I would like to congratulate and probably be the first to officially congratulate Dr. Ratan Tata. Well, you've heard the formal, though heartfelt, part of the uh, evening and now you get behind it and get a chance to hear about the person behind the achievements. So the format that we're going to follow is a question and answer. Uh, the Chancellor and I will ask some questions and Mr Tata will choose to answer as he wishes um, and, uh, and display, I think, a great affinity for Australian humour. Uh, so 
Chancellor, over to you to kick off the question. Well, firstly, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice-Chancellor and I think we're Michael Parkinson. We obviously not, but we have a guess that Michael Parkinson would die to interview. <laughs> so I think we'll be able to make up for it. Dr. Tata, when we did our researches, we realised that you came from a family that started in business in the 1860s. You came basically from a business dynasty. It occurred to us to ask you, firstly, did you always want to go into business or did you have to because you were part of this dynasty? And secondly, did the dynasty form the way you think about business? Actually, I, I had no intention of entering the Tata group. I studied to be an architect and graduated as an architect from Cornell. And as Cornell was called, I, I migrated to Los Angeles where it was warm to, to work in an architect's office. My grandmother fell ill and called for me and that's how I went back or I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, when I went back, uh, I got pushed into the uh, family business uh, and uh, have been there ever since. The, the business environment in the family probably did have a lot to do with uh, my feeling at ease with, with business, but uh, just to tell you how, how pleasant I found it to be, I almost went back to America three times during the, uh, <laughs> the period that I was so-called in training. So uh, shoveling limestone wasn't my favorite kind of job. And there were many others that were similar. So things happened after a while and, and it became a little more meaningful. I wanted to look at, because the Vice-Chancellor also mentioned the shoveling of limestone, do you think that's an important part of one's development in business to actually be literally at the coal face? Well, the way I looked at it at that time was that somebody was trying to make me fail <laughs> or, or go back. Uh, but in hindsight, I think it was a wonderful leveler and, and a means of not letting someone get aspirations uh, that at that time were untrue. So looking back on it, I'm grateful for it. At that time, I was not. <laughs> In everybody's development, there's always one or two, <coughs> two people that are one's mentors, one's teachers, and so on. Did you have a mentor, a group of mentors, and how did they influence your business career? If I look, look back, perhaps one mentor would have been Mr. J. R. D. Tata, who was the chairman of the group. Not so much because he was the businessman he was. I, I could not have appreciated that as a, as a young man, but because both of us were pilots and we had a common love for aviation, so he became the aviator uh, role model for, for me. The other two that, that come to my mind are uh, Dr. Bose, who, who is, is an American now, but of Indian origin, who, who uh, built a very successful audio company in the United States, and we have shared many, many business philosophies, uh, philosophies of life together. And uh, the third, perhaps, would be a person who has been the chairman of Cummins uh, and AT&T, uh, Lucent, uh, Henry Schott, who has been playing an important part in being a mentor to me as I've gone through difficulties, I've always turned to him. Other than that, I don't think there have been very many mentors that I've had. Thank you. Dr. Tata, uh, 
I can use that now. Um, I mean, forget to. Yep. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you look around and where is he? <laughs> yes. Uh, when, when I uh, read out the uh, citation, uh, there was a quote that I, I want to go back to. Uh, in 1991, you became chair and you embarked on a campaign of modernising the company, pulling together many loosely connected companies into a group with several distinct business lines and a centralised management. And I have a couple of questions about that. I'll just ask you, the first is, how did you go about this and why? I mean, describe the Tata before you were chair and then the Tata that you sought to create. Okay, the, the group of companies I uh, inherited uh, basically were like a disparate group of companies. We represented ourselves if I recall, in about 30 different ways. Uh, we had different names, we had different logos, we had uh, identities that didn't necessarily make you feel that you were part of the same group, and we were often referred to as a loose confederation of companies. Uh, it seemed to me that we would we would gain greatly if we could integrate ourselves in and appeared to face the public as one single group. So I, I went out and hired a, a corporate uh, designer to, to develop a common logo for the group. Uh, this was, of course, uh, uh, negated by my seniors who felt this was unnecessary. And I did it anyway, and, and we then, <laughs> that, that was the impetuousness of relative youth. I say relative because uh, I was at that time in my 50s, and they were in their 80s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the, other thing, the other thing I did was uh, create a, a contractual bond that set out a mode of, or code of conduct that they would operate on to, in order to be eligible to use the logo and to try and integrate methods and systems, et cetera, between, between companies. It forced me to become the chairman of each of the companies, again, by the... <coughs> viewed by the elders as being an ego issue, but it was more an issue of trying to be able to mm. push through what one wanted to do. How many companies were you chairing then at that time? Well, the first, uh, the first count we had of, of what constituted the group was 80 companies. Oof. When you went further, you found it was closer to 300 companies. <laughs> So <clears throat> I became the chairman of, I think, eight or nine of the major companies, and, and the others uh, integrated underneath, underneath that. And so um, it came together, and, and I think slowly the various companies saw the benefit of that. And certainly, externally, we got uh, represented or visible as one, as one group. We um, hear a lot about the general electric management approach, and Jack Welch has been a prolific book writer. If, if you were to write a book about the Tatar approach to management, what would be some of the chapter headings? Well, <laughs> that's something that I, I don't know how to answer. Uh, <laughs> You see what happens when you become a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't know th I don't know that uh, there's a way I can answer other than the fact that I, I could ad at least address the group in, in a single way. So we, we set ourselves some goals. We would never have been able to do that if we were a disparate number of companies. And um, 
there was one person speaking for the goal, so when we decided that we should grow inorganically, which we had never done, or look beyond the shores of India, which we had never done, one was able to talk to the entire group as, as one. If those became the methods we used, which then happened to give us growth, I, I suppose that would be what I would write about, which somebody asked me to. And coming back to what um, you, you talked to the Chancellor about, the code of conduct, uh, is, that an, is that an important part of the Tatar approach? And, and what are the main precepts of the code of conduct? Yes, I, I view that as, as possibly being the, the most important uh, inheritance we had, or the most important heritage we had. India was and is uh, slowly deteriorating in the fragment, in, in the fabric of its values and, and ethics, as many countries may be experiencing, certainly in the business community. And what the group was built on by, by its founder and then pursued very diligently by J.R. Ditata was to hold to a value system and a set of ethics. We did not partake in any corruption. We did not bribe. We did not uh, facilitate or use facilitators. And it seemed to me that if we let that go, we would just be another company. So I made that, in fact, the cornerstone of what we stood for, and that we would do business in that way. Many young people came to me from within and said I was dooming the group because we would lose, lose out. And my response was that um, I wanted to go home at night thinking that I had not succumbed. It was a wonderful feeling, and we didn't do too badly, given that we still <laughs> haven't paid for anything. We've lost some, we've had some disad disadvantages, but on the whole, I feel very proud of what the people have done. I can't resist asking this question. Um, you know, you've got to be a little bit uh, provocative, but I noticed in an article today in a number of the newspapers where they were talking about us bringing in perhaps the concept of quotas, oh. of quotas for women working in business in Australia. And one of the newspapers said, this is what's going to happen in the corporate law in India. So it occurred to me, I mean, that you have been an absolute stalwart for equality. You've been a stalwart for so many principles. What do you think of the concept of quotas for business? I think quotas are a forced uh, measure of creating or dispelling with inequalities. I think meritocracy should be the prime means of giving equal opportunities to everyone. Quotas tend to create disadvantaged groups out of previously advantaged groups. And maybe solutions lie elsewhere rather than quotas. Qu quotas Quotas have a certain negativity in terms of taking away the importance of merit. Can I turn to, as the Vice-Chancellor read out, and, and when you look at it, it's just amazing, your attitude and what you and your family have done for philanthropy. In Australia, it is said that our wealthy don't give. And I wondered if a, a proper question might be to ask you, what would you say to the wealthy of Australia? You know, why should they be philanthropic? Well, if I were to answer that uh, honestly, I wouldn't know because the money that went into the, the foundations that were created was done by my great-grandfather. We never saw the money. We were, the family today earns I mean, owns about 2% of the company. Uh, the rest of it is, 65% uh, of it is held by two charitable trusts, which have existed for over 150 years, or 120 years. 
And in those years, they have built medical and educational institutions. And it has become a way of life for our companies to look after the communities around where they've operated. And we have, we mean uh, my uh, predecessor and, and I, have just been administrators of this uh, philanthropy. So all my life I have uh, been an administrator of something that has been established of humbly have to say, have not ever given it out of my pocket. But the compassion and the satisfaction of seeing what you can do and the difference you can make is immeasurable. And tell me, moving from that satisfaction, a lot is talked about about a person's legacy. And when you look at the achievements you've had, they're enormous. If you were there, and this is not writing a book, so, but if you were there to say, what is my legacy? What are you most proud of and what do you think will stand the test of time of what you've done? I think what I would like to feel that I've left behind as a legacy has been the leading the group through a, a difficult, difficult period of time and have it grow without at all sacrificing its value system. Uh, and, and also, I think, transforming the Tata group from what was often in the past called a stodgy conservative group into a, a more uh, growth-oriented group going into newer areas. Uh, I would like to feel that that would be something that that could be looked back on time and said that this was something I left behind. But more than anything else, I think the legacy, I would, or the satisfaction I would feel the greatest good about would be to think that I never compromised, always did what I thought was the right thing, even if there were tough consequences for it. It's wonderful. I wonder, Doctor, if I could... The name uh, is Rotten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder if, if I could switch gear a bit and, and talk about uh, uh, the relationship between our countries. Uh, you know, in many respects, uh, it's a, at a personal level a very easy relationship. Australia's at a time when it's reaffirming it's part of Asia and this, this region rather than part of Europe and America government has just reaffirmed that. How, how do you s assess the Australia-India relationship and what are some of the things we might do to strengthen it? I think the two countries have a reason to do much more together than they have, have done. Australia is a very advanced economy. It, it, it has established its own technology in many areas. Some of it uh, not so publicized, but in high technology, Australia is, is really on the forefront of many, many areas of high technology. India seeks, in many cases, some of that technology. Uh, Australia produces products that India could, could use and would have a larger market than Australia. We produce, in terms of population, one Australia every year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and that's not meant to be good or bad. <laughs> so what I mean is that we have a market of uh, about 350 million consumers going shortly to five or 600 million. And I think it would be terrific to see Australian companies uh, having products in that kind of market scale, which Australia doesn't provide at this point in time. Similarly, there would be issues from India that, that could serve the Australian market, even though for Indian reasons it's small. 
And uh, in the first instance, I think a free trade agreement between Australia and India might remove some of the barriers that, that exist. Exchange of uh, students uh, would be another. And uh, internships back and forth between, between people of the two countries, I think, would be a third. We just have to make the two countries more familiar with each other at a, at a citizen level. And, and what advice would you give us in terms of doing that? Because in a sense, we're the small part of the relationship. You know, as you put it so beautifully, you produce in Australia every year. I was hearing you produce an Australian cricket team every year. <laughs> uh, so uh, in a sense, the, the onus is on us. And what would you advise us to do? I think uh, in the recent past, I've seen free trade agreements really, really do achieve a lot. And a good exchange of, of students in education has a tremendous long-term benefit between two countries. You, if I went to college in America, I will always have a piece of my heart in America. People that have come to Australia, I'm sure, would do the same, similarly in reverse. So I think there needs to be a greater bonding of the people, which will come from these uh, such moves. Thank you. No, I, I, I just want everybody to know we didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> um, because uh, having just celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Colombo plan at this university, it's just wonderful to hear someone come to that independently. But Fred, I think you're going to open it up yeah. to other people's I have, questions. I have one more question which you reminded me of because we asked our Colombo plan uh, early graduates this question. If you reflect on your university education, what are the things that have been of greatest value to you as you pass along through the various stages of your career? Well, you know, for someone coming from India from, if I might say so, prominent family, to be thrown into Cornell, which had a student body of some 40,000 students at that time, in a freshman class of 2,000, made you a little fly in a, in a large room. Uh, the first, the first uh, meeting we had in, in the hall where there was an indoctrination gave you great comfort by, by the president of the university saying, look to your left and your right. One of the people on either side of you will not be there when you graduate. <laughs> 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 As you went through, uh, you wondered whether you might be the one that might not be there. But as you, as you went through this very competitive environment and you assimilated knowledge, it became, you became bonded or welded to this, uh, to this university and the, a sort of loyalty built in, uh, which which replaced fear. And I would say the, the greatest investment my parents made would probably be the fact that they sent me to a good university. I'm sorry, it, I'm not saying that about, uh, about <laughs> yours. I never went there, but. Uh, but, but you've, you've yeah. just got a degree from us. So, <laughs> <we're>... <laughs> <laughs> so give me some time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> So all the achievements from here on in are ours. <laughs> I think on behalf of all of us would uh, again just like to thank uh, Dr. Tata for passing his first oral uh, <laughs> so eloquently. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, what it takes to come here and do this with us, um, Dr. Tata is on his way to the United States he stopped here last night and he's leaving here now very shortly uh, to continue flying towards the United States. And uh, for you to make that effort for this country, this state, this university is something that we really value and appreciate. 
and I think that we've been uh, treated to some wonderful stories and examples tonight. And if you could again show your appreciation for our newest graduate.